Okay, I'm not even sure you can hear me, but <laughs> like their houses are gonna fall. So we can pretty much feel it. I mean, it's uh, the ground is shaking. They're just hammering the ground like crazy. Yeah. I'm Dario, I'm the Digital Content Manager for Habitat for Humanity Great Britain. Here we've just arrived in the amazing city of Recife in Brazil, where we'll be filming a documentary about land rights and evictions, visiting different communities every day to see how they're coping with the problem of evictions. Um, we'll be doing that with Heidi, who's my colleague in the digital team, as well as Julia, who's our colleague here in Habitat Brazil, who is great, she has all the contacts, she knows all the community leaders, um, it's going to be an amazing week and we really look forward to uh, showing you the stories behind the city. For our first day, Julia takes us on a tour of the city to give us the lay of the land. With a population of over 200 million, Brazil has a housing deficit that affects 30 million people. Another 50 to 60 million people live in substandard homes that is mainly in favelas, the typical type of slums that you find in Brazil, as well as mud houses and other types of makeshift homes that you find in rural areas. Recife in particular is a very interesting case because it has some of the wealthiest families in Brazil living side by side with some of the poorest. And it's one of those neighborhoods, one of the most expensive ones in the city that we're going to visit today. Here, huge condos are essentially high rises where the rich elevate themselves above the rest of the population. These buildings are considered safer, they're, you know, they're kind of further away from, you know, the population. You go into one of these condos and you have basically an entire, just this whole structure. The city is also, so it's, a, it's the smallest capital in Brazil in terms of size. And it's one of the most densely populated cities of Brazil as well. And so there isn't any more room to build inside the city of Recife. Verticalizing the city was a way that the real estate market found to sell more um, more apartments and, and more real estate to people who had that financial capability. But that also means evicting a lot of people from their homes. So today we're visiting an area that deals with one of the highest rates of eviction in the entire country. Eles foram aterrando, aterrando e começaram a construir. 
nisso despertou o interesse imobiliário. So we're here at the, uh, the island of destiny or fate, uh, Ilha do Destino. It probably sort of was when uh, it was all mangroves around here and now it's very, very urban. Um, and they've kept their name because it really feels like an island of houses, an island of homes um, that are surrounded and very much cornered by huge buildings where the richest people in the city and in the state um, have come to live um, and it's quite an aggressive uh, occupation almost they call the police all the time whenever they have a small party but those guys are allowed to have their own parties in their tall buildings so it's very much a, a one-way very unequal type of relationship um, and it does feel like a really tiny island that's getting cornered and more and more people are evicted about 500 people have already been evicted and somewhere around 200 are left so um, yeah, it's really quite something. Em 75, começou a especulação para tirar a gente daqui. Chegou três homens falar com minha mãe, que já tinha saído já várias pessoas daqui com medo. Ela disse não sai. Se vocês quiserem derrubar a casa, se vocês quiserem derrubar a casa, em cima da minha escola, em cima da minha escola, aqui não sai. Aí o que aconteceu? O pessoal que morava aqui saiu recuando. E, na verdade, a ilha destinou uma só. Com essa especulação, tem que dividir. E nisso, no vácuo que ficou, o pessoal que saiu daqui foi para outro lugar e outro foram morar mais para dentro. É, começou a ocupar o espaço vazio, porque todo mundo não saiu. Aí, com a especulação imobiliária, o pessoal foi saindo, foi expressando. Aí, o que aconteceu? Ela vendeu e dividiu a, a comunidade. Eu não me sinto nem acuada, eu me sinto retrita. É como se você viesse assim, uma pessoa está lhe chegando, está lhe chegando, está lhe chegando. Você fica constrangida, você fica acuada, espremida. Você fica até como se fosse em fôlego, porque eu cresci brincando nessas ruas. Eu brincava, corria, voltava para casa, não tinha perigo de carro, não tinha perigo de... A violência, como, como hoje fui crescendo no tempo. She was saying that when the buildings are being built, they need to they need to dig really deeply and like get, and bang into the ground um, to put the pillars. Yeah. And so she was saying that when they can feel the house like shaking um, when they're doing that. So when they built this building out front, that's right next door, um, it was so it was so strong that the house started to crack. It was so strong that like the, one of the shingles on the roof is actually askew because of how hard the vibrations were. So, we've just found the, uh, the giant hammer. They just, yeah, they're just hammering the ground like crazy. You can feel the tremors. So, yeah, I mean, no doubt that, like, the houses are falling apart. And it's, yeah, it's really insane. Foi quando ela começou a falar com a vizinhança, mobilizar a vizinhança, uhum. começou a mobilizar a comunidade e procurar os interesses. Uhum. E isso ela começou com outros moradores aqui, e na prefeitura, e reivindicar com alguns vereadores, e reivindicar com o que ela podia chegar, ela fez. E isso ela não tinha orientação, ela não tinha estudo. Uhum. Ela veio terminar o segundo grau com 66 anos. A gente conseguiu, com prazer, conseguir fazer a área Z. Mas como já havia é, a, a, a divisória da comunidade, só ficou uma parte da, da comunidade. 
Então, essa área aqui que eu moro, essa região aqui, ela não existe. E a gente vai ver se consegue unificar. É, porque aqui, na prefeitura, o projeto é uma praça. For a very long time, there weren't any laws that kind of dictated how high these buildings could go. So you have buildings that have like 40, 50 stories, um, and they're right next to the coastal zone. So that really interrupts our wind flow, for instance, <laughs> in the city. But it's actually a really big issue because it's next. Um, Hesifi is a city that um, is below ocean level because um, the city's built over. Um, I'm gonna see how you say monkey in English, I'm sorry. Because it's all rivers and oceans, yeah, so it's yeah. this very yeah. muddy area, you know? Um, and so the city's kind of sinking in, and then you have all of these buildings that make it sink in further as well. So there are several issues that kind of come up um, because of this growth, this development and this growth that the city had that wasn't planned. In the end, the property developers are getting what they wanted. They wanted to expand the city where the beautiful sandy beaches are and they got most of that land. But they did so regardless of the communities who were already living there and crucially regardless of the terrain. Today we end up with a city that, in part where it was all mangrove before, is now sinking in a little bit more every day. And the city was more than happy to take money from the developers. But it's not always that simple. We'll see next time how sometimes it can also appear to side with its local communities and workers when the city is not getting paid in time. Subscribe to our channel to make sure you see the next episode and the other videos we're working on.